a team of researchers analysed 27 million news articles published between 1970 and 2019. And what they found was that use of words like sexist and racist in the New York Times and in the wider liberal media increased over 400 percent since 2012. Obviously, sexism and racism have not actually increased 400 percent since 2012. It's only the media's use of these terms that's increased. Your writing is so good. Dude, people send me that audience capture article all the time. This most recent one that you did about uh, how smart people make themselves be dumb. Uh, the TikTok article, it's its phenomenal. I, I, you're the only Substack that I pay for. And uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> quite rightly, quite That's rightly so. so what, what can I say? So, my favorite thing Thank to you. do with your Twitter is go through some of the mental models, biases, and ideas that you've got. And we're going to go through as many as we can today. First one is chilling effect. When punishment for what people say becomes widespread, people stop saying what they really think and instead say whatever is needed to thrive in the social environment. Thus, limits on speech become limits on sincerity. Yeah, so I mean, so this is, you know, a, a sort of very timely thing, I think, because there's a lot of talk about sort of suppressing people from social media and stuff. and. Um, I think people should really realize that stopping people from airing their true opinions doesn't change their opinions. It just makes them mask their opinions. Um, and when this happens at scale, it can lead to all kinds of absurd situations uh, like the Abilene paradox. I don't know if we've covered the Abilene paradox. Run it back. It's basically a, situ yeah, it's basically a situation where everyone professes a belief that no one actually believes purely because they think everybody else believes it. And so you can have a situation where literally everybody just is saying stuff that is just not true for the sole reason that they think everybody else thinks it's true. And an example of this um, would probably be considered sort of um, the, the issue of what a woman is. Um, you've got pretty much everybody in the mainstream culture now pretending that they don't know what a woman is. Um, but if you were to ask these people in private, they would probably be able to tell you. They'd just probably say an adult human female but because there's this sort of stigma now around knowing what a woman is people you know basically sort of they have to pretend like they don't know and uh, it's just it leads to absurd situation after absurd situation and that's why i think it's it's i mean there's many reasons there's many arguments against censorship but this is definitely one of the, the strongest i think um you're not by censoring people, you're not changing their behavior, you're not changing their opinions, you're not changing their beliefs. All you're doing is just sort of sweeping them under the carpet, you know, and they're just going to continue. Just You just won't be, be able to see it anymore. So you yes. can't keep track of these people anymore. This ties into your view about uh, when people are their opinions, they feel like they have to have an opinion on anything and everything, and changing your opinion is tantamount to destruction of yourself. So because people value their opinions so much in this situation, quite rightly, your, um, the performative nature of having the right opinion of the Abilene paradox, playing along with that has never been more important because mm. opinions have never been more relevant to our status within the world. Yeah, absolutely. And you see this reflected most in the precisely the industries that you would expect it to be reflected in, i.e. the industries that are image oriented. So if you have a look at people who have the most fashionable opinions, I mean, Rob Henderson would probably call these luxury beliefs. They're sort of, you know, fashionable opinions that uh, people adopt in order to sort of signal status. Um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we all used to like buy sweatshirts which had like brand names st stamped across the front of them, like you know, Fila or Nike. You know, when you're a kid at school, because you want everybody to know that you paid paid for it. So nowadays, when you get older, you no longer wear these labels. Now it's opinions instead. Uh, you know, you have the, the she her and the he him instead of poor harm, poor femme. You know, <laughs> and um, it's sort of like you see this in Hollywood. You see it amongst Hollywood actors. You see it amongst academics. You see it in politics. You see it in all of the industries where image is important, where basically appearing to have the right opinions is more important than actually having the correct opinions. 
Yes, and it's also an industry where opinions and actions have never been more diverged, right? You know, somebody now can have a Twitter account that proselytizes the right uh, beliefs and in private hold completely different beliefs or the way that they go about living their lives be totally different. You could be an online vegan who's an offline carnivore. And for as long as the twine shall never meet, uh, it kind of doesn't really matter so much. Whereas in the past, your ability to profess a belief that you didn't live up to in reality would have been much more difficult to diverge, especially in before the internet, right? Or before print media, there is no way for you. Your, your opinions are very much your actions, right? There is no way to do this and to bifurcate you and what you say from what you and what you are and what you do. So yeah, it, it's um, the opportunity and the motive have aligned to uh, create this chilling effect. Yeah, absolutely. I think people have, what the digital age has done is it's separated the person from the persona. Um, so now, you know, there's a, a much wider gulf between how you appear to others and how you actually are than there ever was because of the sort of uh, importance of social media in our daily lives. And so because of that sort of dissociation, there's now a big gulf between uh, the beliefs that people profess and what they actually believe in real life. There's no consequences nowadays for what a person actually believes, really, um, in most of the time anyway, at least as long as you have the fashionable opinions, you know. Uh, if you have unfashionable opinions, then there is consequences. But if you if you believe something like, for instance, um, uh, that it's not a problem for, um, like, for instance, there was this issue in Scotland recently about um, that there was a rapist who was locked in a, a women's prison briefly, and then there was an outcry, outcry about it over the internet, which sort of led Nicola Sturgeon to walk it back and may have led to a, res- a resignation. Um, but I mean, if you're like a, a really, really sort of uh, rich Hollywood actor, um, and you, you know, you, you, you've got no, you know, nobody who's going to go to prison. There's nobody in your life who's ever gone to prison or anything like that. Uh, you don't need to worry about anybody you know being hurt by your opinions on whether women should be whether a trans rapist should be allowed in a woman's prison so you're not paying the consequences other people are paying the consequences and you could say the same thing about black crime rates or whatever you know people say that um you know black people are be, being shot at a dispro- disproportionate rate um by police um and that this is purely due to systemic racism um you know if you're a hollywood actor you don't need to worry about uh, the true causes of the sort of uh, your crime rates in 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 black neighborhoods. So or you could the, just say it's all just systemic of, racism. Yeah, or the outcomes of defunding the police, right? Defund the police exactly. would be a perfect yeah. example of this. Say it, but yeah. yours isn't the neighborhood where you need police in any case. Okay, so next one. Epistemic humility. Instead of trying to be right, try to be less wrong. The investor Charlie Munger said, it is remarkable how much long-term advantage people like us have gotten by trying to be consistently not stupid instead of trying to be very intelligent. Avoiding idiocy is much simpler than achieving genius, so it's easier to turn it into a habit. Furthermore, if we try to be right, then we'll often convince ourselves we're right, even if we're not. But if we begin from the position that we're wrong and we simply try to be less wrong, we gain more awareness in our blind spots and become less wedded to our beliefs, reducing our resistance to learning. Yeah, so this has got wide applications. Uh, I use this in every endeavor, really. Um, particular one that I found is very useful was uh, my approach to writing. Because when I first started writing, I used to try to sound smart. I tried to be intelligent. And what this led to was me using a lot of really fancy words, a lot of big words. So instead of using the word tiptoe, I would use the word digitigrade, you know, and I'd use all these other really long words that people just didn't know what, what I was talking about. And because they didn't know what I was talking about, what actually happened was that by trying to be smart, I became less clear in my communication. So I basically, I was becoming more stupid and people had less understanding of what I was trying to say. So it backfired. And it was then that I realized that actually good writing is not about trying to sound smart. It's about avoiding sounding stupid uh, by just using, you know, you can use simple language um, to communicate clearly 
rather than trying to sort of signal sophistication or anything like that. And when you can commu communicate clearly, um, then you naturally become smarter because your your thoughts and your you know what what you write reflect each other. So if you think clearly, you'll write clearly, and if you write clearly, you'll think clearly. Um, you know, if you try to think in these big long words that you barely understand, you're not going to really develop a good understanding of of what you're actually thinking. Have you heard? The, so this is one one example. Have you heard the mental model never multiply by zero? I think I have, but I can't recall what it is. You might have to remind me. I've yeah, so it ties in. It ties into this perfectly. So never multiply by zero describes avoiding situations that could permanently get you out of the game, whatever that game may be. So for instance, you could have the perfect health and fitness regime, making sure that you eat organic fruit and vegetables, your micros and macros are perfect. You sleep eight hours every night and you're hydrated thoroughly throughout the day, but you have a common habit of driving a car without a seatbelt. It's like, okay, all of the good things that you're doing, it's 45 times seven times 1.2 times 360 times zero. If you multiply any sequence of numbers by zero, the outcome is zero. It's the same as you've been saving for a long time and uh, working hard on your education and you can't wait to move away, but you commonly have unprotected sex and accidentally get pregnant. Okay, that has put a very big change. That has stopped a lot of the things that you had intended. And it's the same here. It is, it is remarkable how much long-term advantage people like us have gotten by trying to be consistently not stupid instead of trying to be very intelligent. You can get so much success in life simply by avoiding failure because so many people multiply either by zero or by, by a half or by three quarters and it takes down so much of the good work that they've done. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, it's, the, it's the lowest common denominator issue, isn't it? It's people can focus all of their energies on certain things and maximize those, you know, until their heart's content, but they'll neglect one tiny aspect of their life and then that will be the thing that brings them down and um i think when you when you're trying to be smart you can get lost in trying to excel at one particular thing whilst neglecting all of the other things that are periphery but which are just just as important uh, all of the supporting things I, i've found just it simplifies life so much when you just try not to be stupid you know it just it's just such a a more elegant and simple way to live than to try to be smart. I don't have any, I, you know, I used to signal a lot to people, you know, especially on social media and stuff where I used to try to just be as smart as I possibly could, but it would often just lead me into just complete stupidity because I would just be hyper-focused on one thing, trying to make that thing as perfect as possible. And in, in so doing, I'd neglect everything else uh, which was needed. So yeah, I mean, it's all about being a generalist. It's not about being a specialist anymore. You know, if you want to excel in life now, you've got to be a generalist. You've got to be good at, you've got to have a baseline sort of goodness at everything rather than, you know, being super good at one thing. Because that super goodness at one thing can lead you astray. Interesting. Okay, next one. Cunningham's Law. The best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question, but to post the wrong answer. Because people are more interested in criticizing others than helping them. This is so incisive. It's so correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the actual, I mean, Cunningham's law is basically just um, the best way to get the right answer on the internet is, is not to ask a question, but post the answer. And then I was the one who who basically decided that it was because people are more interested in criticizing others than helping them. So I don't want to um, give the impression that, you know, if just in case this turns out to be wrong, that that, that was the law. His law is just the first part of that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it, I, I've witnessed this constantly since i've been on social media you know places like twitter and reddit i even i think i even did this experiment myself where i actually asked a question and i got very little response and then i deliberately posted the the wrong answer i'm pretty sure i did that once earlier in 2016 or something like that because this is something that i've thought about for a long time and um i think many people are constantly on the lookout for someone to ridicule and i think they they want that because they want to feel better about themselves so if if you give people an opportunity to make them look smarter than you they will take it you know because people want validation on social media and one of the ways people get validation is by pointing out when other people get things wrong 
Um, I mean, I, I used to do this a lot as well. I used to, I used to. Re I mean, I don't know if I was trying to seek validation. Maybe I was subconsciously, but I did get this drive to really point out when people got things wrong, and I felt like a duty almost to do it. I don't do it anymore, but I used to always do it on social media. If I saw something that was incorrect, I would just feel like, no, no, no this is wrong, and you know, I'd, I'd bask in the praise afterwards. Well, and your think, your your smarts stand on the shoulders of somebody else's stupidity right so by pointing at the stupidity really interesting thing so i'm i'm all for um calling out the performative incentives of social media but chris voss the guy that wrote never split the difference he was the former head of the fbi's negotiation team he said that one of the ways that he extracts information from people who are either unwitting or unwilling is he will uh, make proposals about them that are wrong, but that they want to correct. So, for instance, he'll say, "That's a that's a great accent. Is that uh, that's Hull, isn't it? That's uh, you're you're from Hull." No, 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 I'm actually from Huddersfield. You go, oh, yeah, interesting. But you, I mean, you must be a Pisces. I actually am an Aquarius. And you go, okay, I've got the place that you live and the month of your birth there simply by proposing things that are wrong. And I, I it's, I don't know where it comes from. It, it can't just be performative fanciness on the internet it's something deeper than that it's a desire to close loops of erroneous information and i think that that just gets maybe magnified when the internet's involved yeah yeah i think uh i think that probably is part of it people probably do it for different reasons i mean this is quite it's quite a general sort of concept so i mean you know i'm sure it's not just a specific it has one specific cause um but yeah i mean i think it, it's always better. You get a lot more information out of people by getting them to tell you what they want to tell you rather than trying to sort of railroad them into an answer, you know? So I think a lot of sort of interrogators would probably do that. I don't know. I don't know their tactics, but I could see them doing that. Um, you know, they would rather than, rather than actually asking you a question, they would give you a statement that would lead you to a certain response. I think because then you don't feel like you're being interrogated as well. You know, you feel like you're just giving the information freely, which probably is, is better for them. Um, you know, so I don't know, but I'm not an expert in that, so I don't know. Next one, Wittgenstein's ruler. The less you know of the measurer compared to the thing being measured, the less the measurer's measure measures the thing being measured and the more it measures the measurer. As an analogy, if a man says everyone he meets is an asshole, the asshole is likely him. You can apply this concept to any source of information. For example, if a news outlet's stories frequently outrage you, instead of taking it as evidence that the world is becoming more outrageous, consider the possibility that the news outlet is deliberately trying to outrage you and temper your reactions accordingly. Basically, never take information at face value and always ask yourself, what does the info from this source suggest about the source itself? Yeah, so I'll, ne I'll never sort of understand why people just take information at face value. You know, I see it just constantly online where somebody will say something and then nobody questions the motives behind the person saying it. They just, it's as though it's like chat GPT saying it to them, you know, they'll just accept whatever it is, is being said without any kind of uh, suspicion towards the motives behind why did somebody say this? You know, what does this say about the source of the information? Um, I think it's just a very, very important skill for media literacy in the age of misinformation there's you know there's, there's always an agenda behind every piece of information that is shown on your screen um apart from in the cases of chat gpt but but that's a, a different issue but like when you're getting information from other human beings there's always an agenda there there's always some reason why you're being shown that information some reason why they've chosen to disclose that information and i think it's always worth considering what those p potential agendas could be because that is half of the information you're being given you know if you're just accepting the information at face value you're only receiving half of the information uh you need you need the other half you need the, the other half the context you know so um you, you see this you know if, if for instance like the guardian uh posts something about um the economy you know and then you see that the author and then you can do a bit of background research into that person's views on economics. And then it's amazing how much information that will provide you when you actually read the article. Oh, so that because is... Because then you'll suddenly... Yeah, that would be the, the first line of Wittgenstein's ruler is the less you know of the measurer. So what you're doing there is you're learning more about the measurer. 
Yeah. Yeah, you, you want to get as, mo as much information about both sources. You want to get, sorry, not both sources, about the, the source and the information. So you want to get as much information about both. And you should, the, the ruler in this case is the one that you have the most information about. So if you have more information about the information than the source, then you should use the information to measure the source. And if you have more information about the source, you should use the source to measure the information. So it's, you know, it's basically like you would, if you had two rulers and you weren't sure which one was correct, you, you knew one of them was correct and the other one wasn't, you would use the correct one to measure the one that wasn't, you know, mm. so it's a similar principle. Interesting. Okay, purity spiral. Members of political tribes inevitably begin competing with their fellows to be the most ideologically pure. The constant one-upmanship toward moral superiority causes the whole group to gradually become more extreme. For example, Maoist China or Twitter echo chambers. Nice that you drew the correlation between those two there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think people have this kind of tendency to turn everything into a competition. And that goes for morality also. You know, if you have a certain dominant ideology, dominant uh, moral ideology, uh, that's fashionable, again, going back to the, the thing that we were talking about before, then people will start competing. They'll turn it into a competition. They'll start gamifying it, essentially. They'll, they'll turn it into an opportunity to, um, to sort of gain an advantage, a social advantage. Uh, and this has been shown throughout history. I mean, you know, it's not just Maoist China. You can look at any regime that had strong sort of laws uh, against certain behaviours or in favour of certain behaviours. And you would see that there were people always who would compete to either call out those behaviours in other people or if they were bad or engage in those behaviours if they were good. You know, literally any any regime you name, you know, you, you, you'll see, you can see examples of it. It's, it's something that's sort of fundamental to our species. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think um, a lot of regimes become uh, more extreme over time you know uh, a lot of them like for instance if you look at if we're going by this sort of uh, the, the example of communism uh, you know, Lenin was pretty bad he was quite bad he wasn't Stalin though you know Stalin was a completely different category of, of sort of authoritarian and it would have continued if, as long as Stalin was there because he got worse and worse as as he gained more and more power and it wasn't just because he was gaining more power it was because the people around him were also becoming more extreme if you have a look at people like Laurenti Beria, for instance, you know, they were also, they became more extreme over time. And part of it was because I think of, of the purity sp spiral where people felt that they had to uh, compete to be as much like Stalin as possible in order to avoid being purged. Um, so in this case, it was literally a life or death matter, but it's not always a life or death matter. Sometimes it's just a case of status, which is more the case on Twitter. Did you ever hear Tim Dillon push back on Joe Rogan's view of LA comedy because this is exactly the I same thing. So uh, Tim's one of the few guys that can kind of poke back at Joe because he's you know similar status and he, he's he's doing well in comedy scene and stuff like that. And Joe was saying about how lovely the LA comedy scene is. You know, every time that he goes through there, everything's just fantastic and everyone treats him so well. And Tim sort of bumped in and said, Joe, you, you do know that you're Joe Rogan, right? That the way that people behave when you step into the room is not representative of how they behave typically for other people, that, that there is a reality distortion field that occurs when this happens. And because of that, your experience may not be representative of everybody else's. Uh, I can't remember the rule that we went through, but this was one of the previous episodes that you featured on, where uh, as somebody gains power, the people around them are more concerned with appeasing the person in power than giving them real information from the world outside. So if you have purity Howard Hughes syndrome, yeah. Howard Hughes syndrome, Howard thank Hughes you. Syndrome. That's it. Um, so if you combine Howard Hughes syndrome with the purity spiral, the purity spiral is the incentive or uh, the purity spiral is like the, the the drive and the direction that that's the what's going on, and then the Howard Hughes syndrome is the fuel that persists and causes that to keep on going. Uh, one one question I've got in my mind is what sort of environment would engender a more purity spiral like situation? What are some of the predictors 
of a, a purity spiral, do you think? So there need to be rewards, incentives, basically, for that kind of behavior. There need to be rewards for extreme behavior. So, um, you know, if you if you look at, say, Twitter, for instance, there are rewards to acting. If you're, you know, if you're like in right wing circles, for instance, then there's an incentive to act based, you know. And if you're in the left wing circles, then there's an incentive to act woke because other people will see you as a sort of paragon of what they believe and then they'll they'll want to retweet you and you know say oh this person if you're based for instance people will say this person doesn't give a fuck you know he's you know basically he, he's, he's sticking it to the libs you know he's, he's triggering the libs or whatever um and you know vice versa with the with the, the left they'll be like you know this person is calling it out like calling out injustice or whatever blah blah, blah. so there's got to be some sort of um social reward for uh, engaging in more extreme behavior than your peers. Uh, that's the first rule. And another thing is, this is probably an even better incentive would be that um, if, if there's a punishment for not acting more extreme, and this is more to do with the sort of Stalinist kind of uh, element of things. So if you look at the purges, for instance, in fact, there's an even better example than that. Um, if you look at, there's a very famous video um, of Saddam Hussein, where he basically is in a room filled with people and um, he basically says that he's uncovered a plot. This was shortly after he, he assumed power. It was shortly after he assumed control in Iraq. And the way that he consolidated power was that he basically concocted this idea that there was a conspiracy against him so that he could, you know, have a pretext to remove people that he didn't like. And he had a list of names and uh, he said that these people had betrayed him. And there was a big packed room filled with people, all of the sort of delegates and diplomats. And one by one, he called out the names of the betrayers and they were led out of the room to their deaths. They were basically executed. And as soon as people realized what was happening, they began to panic and they began to copy Saddam Hussein's actions. So there's a point where he, um, he, he was apparently crying or he was pretending to cry and he got a, a handkerchief and he began to wipe his eyes. And immediately the camera pans to the, the crowd, to the audience. And you see many like people just get handkerchiefs out of their hands. Uh, sorry, out of the pockets, and they begin to um, wipe their own eyes. Exactly how Saddam Hussein is doing, and it, it's. I think it's a sort of. It speaks to sort of this idea that people were so terrified of dying that they just the only they panicked, and the only thing that they knew how to do to prevent from dying was to be as as much like Saddam as possible. In that wow. moment, wow! I imagine one other predictor or another predictor of the purity spiral would be an important in-group, out-group uh, tribal dynamic that's happening. Because the whole purpose of having a purity spiral is to identify others, right? There is us and there is not us. And if you do not do the things, pray, do the shibboleths, etc., that is the us, then you're a not us. And it's why intersectionality in particular is a, a pretty obvious example of what goes on with regards to a purity spiral, because in part, some of it is based on fanciful exaggerations. And also, it's mostly based on not being another as opposed to being a something. When you have a poorly defined something, the only way you can identify yourself is as not being the other. And what that means is, in order to keep group cohesion together, you need to constantly shave off people who are others. It's like if your mutual love of an in-group is not bound together over that. It's bound together over the mutual hatred of an outgroup. You need to permanently find new outgroup members in order to say, well, see, we're not, we're not that. For instance, Douglas Murray, a uh, gay man, but like white and conservative. So he's not really a part of the LGBT movement anymore. You know, like you're just gay. It's like, mm, dude, you really need to be like gay and black with a cl club foot and a gluten intolerance. Like that's really where you need to be at in order to be a part of our, gl our club. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's easier to rally around shared hatreds than shared values. And so there are people always looking to create new things to hate just in order to keep the, the group together. Um, you know, shared values are, are OK for a while, but really what people want is they want to get together to really hate somebody. You know, there's there's few things that bring people together, like hating someone else. And I think a lot of this happens like I mean, you see it in. Um, when uh, there's this thing called rally around the flag syndrome, which is a concept, another one of my mega thread concepts, where 
it's this idea that when uh, leaders are unpopular with the public, what they do is they will start conflicts. They will start foreign conflicts uh, because this will bring people together against a mutual enemy. And uh, I mean, some people have argued that that Putin, part of, part of the reason that Putin invaded Ukraine was that he was flagging in po popularity and people were becoming disillusioned with him. And so he needed to have a sort of external enemy to sort of unite the people and sort of, you know, create this this other that they could sort of level all their hatred against. You see it in, in the novel Animal Farm as well, where um, the character of uh, Napoleon, the pig, Napoleon um, wants to consolidate his power by sort of um, essentially exiling Snowball, who's his rival, and then just sort of blaming him for literally everything that's going wrong, you know, scapegoating. And that's how the sort of animal farm gets consolidated and how they form their sort of their, their, their community by hate, hatred rather than love. This is one of mine. So I've got a new one for you here. And this is Schultz's razor. Do not attribute to group conspiracy that which can be explained by cancellation anxiety. From the outside, it might look like everyone is coordinating to push some ideology or movement. From the inside, everyone is terrified of losing their job if they don't adhere to the new ideological stance. It's not coordination, it's cowardice. A lot of the time, we believe that there is a grand plan at work to try and push a narrative or hurt people from a particular group. From the outside, it looks a lot like a coordinated assault, collusion orchestrated some by some malign overlord conspiracy. But on the ground, it doesn't look anything like that. It's just individuals trying to save their own skin and not get fired. They've got an expensive house they can barely pay the mortgage on and a wife who wants a new car and private school for kids. It's much easier for them to adhere to whatever ideology will keep them in their job rather than go against it. Sure, it might mean that they push an unhinged story about trans story hour for toddlers or ban someone from saying something innocuous on a platform, but this doesn't mean that they've been indoctrinated into some grand plan. The incentives encourage execs, influential actors, and people in power to behave in particular aligned ways, but their coordination is not consciously conducted. It's just a path of least resistance for each person. It doesn't make them less culpable, it makes them less malicious and more cowardly for sure. And Schultz finished this off and said, so much content is curated by a pool getting installed in an executive's yard. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair assessment. I think it's quite accurate. Um, it sounds to me like sort of Hanlon's, Hanlon's razor um, uh, sort of applied to cancel culture. I, I think, yeah, a lot of people are more passive than active when it comes to um, the sort of propagation of new ideologies. And I, I see this pretty much all the time. Um, you know, if we go back to the example of wokeism and stuff like that, uh, it, the, wokeism is largely pushed not by ideologues, not by people who are, you know, actively trying to sort of spread this ideology, but mostly by people who just sort of read Wikipedia, just see woke ideas on there and just accept them as fact and just think, okay, I better not question this because... You know, this is the, the consensus amongst my community. And, you know, if I if I speak out against this, I, I'm going to be in trouble. So I'll just keep my mouth shut. And that's largely how, you know, these ideologies really spread, I think. Um, it's, it's sort of like it goes back to the sort of chilling effect where people are afraid of saying what they really think. So they just keep their mouths shut. And then this allows false ideas to propagate uh, much more quickly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's it's a pretty straightforward. Um, one is, is you said it was Schultz's razor. Who who was the one who who? who so the, Andrew who Schultz on 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 his podcast just talked about the fact that um, he's spent time in Hollywood. In Hollywood, everyone from the outside thinks that it's all of these people trying to trans the kids and stuff. And he said from the inside, it, it, there's none of that. You know, they're blundering around just trying to sort themselves out and get to CrossFit yeah, in time. Yeah. And it, it yeah, just, I I came up with Schultz's razor and then sent it to him and asked if I've got. Uh, if he reckons that it was a good s summation of what he was talking about. And he was like, fucking hell, that's really nice. Do not attribute to group cool. conspiracy that which can be explained by cancellation anxiety. But another thing, the reason that I really like it, and I actually spoke about this in Miami this weekend, I spoke about that, that exact passage, is because it's very reassuring for the people who are concerned that we are facing an insurmountable, coordinated, coalitional assault right, on our freedoms. Mm -hmm. Because what it reminds you is, individual actors' incentives can align in such a way to make it look like collusion, but it's not. And if it's not, it's actually a lot more fractured and, and fragile. And all that you need to do to fix something which isn't a coordinated conspiracy is change the incentives. If the incentives then change, 
that immediately opens up and frees pretty much everything else. Yeah. I think uh, there's that famous quote, which is, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, um, which I think really sort of sums it up. Uh, I think, yeah, I agree. I agree. I don't think that there is some sort of massive conspiracy to trans people or anything like that. You know, I, don't, I think that's just nonsense. Um, I, but I, I mean, what I am worried about is exactly what you've just been saying, which is that there are going to be a lot of people who simply will just accept stuff that that is probably untrue simply because they're afraid. And, you know, I don't have specific con concerns about trans, the trans sort of ideology in particular, but just generally, I think this is a danger um, for pretty much any anything, really. I mean, you know, you've got the equivalent conspiracy theories on the right about the World Economic Forum. So many people believe in this now. They believe that there's some evil, dastardly plot by the WEF to sort of enslave everybody. And I mean, I've looked at the evidence and I'm not convinced by it. I could be wrong, but I think people are just sort of, most people are just sort of accepting it on the right now, just as people are accept, accepting sort of a lot of ideas, woke ideas on the left. You've now got people accepting conspiracy theories on the right just because everybody else is accepting them. And what, um, I think what, that's quite dangerous. What was that? Um, the world has many stupid people and few evil people. Therefore, the world's few evil people Bonhoeffer's cannot succeed. Bonhoeffer's theory of stupidity. Yeah. Bonhoeffer's theory Bonhoeffer's of stupidity. Theory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that's the same as this, right? That's that's precisely exactly, the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that you have, yeah. and it, it would be maybe not stupid people, uh, but just self-interested people, or uh, you know, resourcefully anxious just, people. Yeah. Yeah. Passive, I would say. I just say yeah. passive people because yes. I think, you know, like you alluded to earlier, they're more interested in feeding their families, and who can blame them? You know, um, they want to feed their families. They want to. Um, just live their lives, you know. I mean, why would you know? Wh why worry about all these things that are probably not going to influence our lives sort of very much, unless there's some drastic, you know, uh, sort of uh, tyranny that just suddenly takes over. But that's very unlikely. I mean, I think most of these issues, things like um, the whole thing about the trans ideology and the WFEF and all these other, you know, sort of th theories, uh, they don't really impact the average person uh, very much in their lives. These are really social media issues. These are issues that people get really, really worked up over social media. And this is not to say that there's no real world impact. There is, obviously. But the the level at which they're being discussed is far in excess of their actual real world impact. Uh, there's far more important things to be worrying about, you know, like AI, for instance. Uh, you know, AI is a major, major issue now, but most people are still worried about trans people in toilets. And it's... Um, you know that like AI is literally an ex existential threat. I mean, not in the immediate future, but eventually it will be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once we've got AI now, that will soon give rise to AGI. AGI will probably give rise to a super intelligence, um, and then we we're going to be in, the alignment. In shit. <laughs> yeah, we haven't. We, no, we're exactly, all going to be yeah. fucking paperclip. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's that's long term. I mean, there's short term issues with, with AI, which are even more dangerous, possibly. Which, um, you know, the idea of sort of misinformation now is it can be done on an industrial scale. You can literally just fill the web up with misinformation without any real human labor. Well, and yeah, I mean, think crazy. about if if you were concerned, what, six years ago with Cambridge Analytica? Is that when that came out, six or seven years ago? Yeah, it was, uh, it was about six years ago, I think, yeah. If you're worried about Maybe. Cambridge Analytica um, having a team of copywriters create ads and then use rudimentary algorithmic analysis to target those to people that they think it'll impact the most. Imagine having a virtual avatar that reflects every social media user's preferences that exists on the internet and have them be able to create the perfectly persuasive, individually tailored message to nudge your preferences over time, that it can account for neuro-linguistic programming, it can have controlled opposition that shows you the other side. You know, I mean, it's, I think both of us are of the opinion that within the next five years or so, almost all of the content that is produced on social media won't be produced by humans. I spoke to uh, Rob Wiblin, the guy that does 80,000 hours. He's big in the effective altruism community and long-termism right, and yeah. existential risk. He, as a career podcaster, 
like myself, says that within 10 years, he thinks that AI will do his job better than he ever can. So he's already looking to wind down into retirement from podcasting. Podcasting was one of the few things where I considered that it might be a little bit more safe, given that people don't tune in for the rote indexing of information, but they tune in more for the natural human vibe, which is inherently difficult to predict. Like the way that language learning models work is it's essentially predictive text just replicated over time, but all the way. So by design, it's a very predictive form of communication, an unpredictive form, which is where you might actually uh, find something charming or endearing or funny or whatever. Uh, come, it is significantly more complex computationally. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think the, the sort of that, that really does touch on something very important there. I think what you just said, um, there is a certain randomness to human behavior, which is inherently valuable, I think, which people value more than um, sort of the perfection, the so-called perfection of things that are artificially created. Um, and you can see this. I mean, there's actually there are um, apps now which can actually which purport to be able to determine whether a piece of text was written by an AI or, or by a human. Uh, they use a measure called perplexity, which is exactly what you were just saying, a measure of the randomness of the of uh, text or whether it's representative. I think probably averageness is a better term for it. It's basically how, how um, indicative of the training data a piece of text is. Um, so perplexity is actually turned out to be a really, really bad way of determining whether something was written by an AI or a human. And I use this myself. I got an, an essay uh, that I wrote in 2017, and I fed it into this machine, this device, uh, which basically is supposed to determine whether I'm a human or an AI. And it accused me of being an AI. I knew. I fucking knew it. it. <laughs> I fucking knew it all along. You bastard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the bastard. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I, I thought, you know, okay, fair enough. I'll do it again. And I did it a few times. And I think once or twice it got it correct. It, it managed to identify me as a human. But most of the time it was calling me an AI, right? And that's because um, I was writing in a style which was very indicative of journalism uh, back in 2017 because I was, I was writing for a, a, a magazine called Rabbit Hole and they had a very strict editorial style. And so I was writing, um, I was writing sentences sort of very clean. I wasn't adding much of my own character to the sentences. I was just mm, they were quite writing, predictable in a way. You know, exactly. And that's why it came to that conclusion. But it shows that really, you know, um, it, it's very, uh, I think what people really want is, is they want a bit of flair, I think, to writing. They don't want um, just the information just to be given to them. They want the information to be given to them with a bit of flair. And I think you see that not just in, in writing, but you see it in, in a lot of industries. I mean, for instance, people like flaws. They like the human flaws that only a human has um, yep. because that gives things character. For instance, if you look at a diamond, uh, you have synthetic diamonds now, which are far more um, perfect and flawless than real diamonds that are sort of mined and yet mine diamonds are far more valuable they they sell for just far more money and i think part of that is because the flaws are actually what make it valuable the fact not just the flaws but also the fact that it was dug out of the earth by a human Effort. and it has a story behind it you know i think that story the, the the history of that thing is is what gives it value people call it people in the art world uh, call it provenance and that's one of the things that gives human made things value is that they have a story behind them um, you know, if you have something that's just sterile and perfect and, you know, just clear and has no idiosyncrasies, yep. it kind of diminishes the value of it. Even though it's it's perfect on a technical level, it's not, it doesn't have a story. You know? It's also that's sterile, people want. right? It's very sterile yeah. to do it that way. This is what I tell fledgling podcasters that ask for advice is your job is not to perfectly index all of the information in yours or the guest's head and that forgetting that town that's on the west coast of the the north of england that's what's it called it's near manchester blackpool like that's that is part of the vibe it is adding to the character of you as a person and there are podcasters out there that spend a lot of money on editors to go through and remove any heavy breaths or pauses or mistakes by them or the guest or whatever and 
I mean, if you want that, you can go to Blinkist, as far as I'm concerned. it's The job is to ask questions that are outside of the scope of the book, that are unique, that you can't get elsewhere, and also to create a vibe. You know, if you and your friend yeah. can't breathe because you're laughing for 20 seconds, that's part of you. And it, it speaks massively, I think, as well, a, a, an over-reliance on that, whether it be online with writing or in podcasting or in YouTube or whatever. It speaks massively to an insecurity that you are not worthy of acceptance or that your work or you as a person is not going to be enjoyed by the audience. And I understand that. I understand why in a presentation you might want to overthink and so on and so forth. But being able to let go, and again, this is only something that you can achieve through many repetitions of doing anything of this kind. But you must have found this with writing, that as you get out of your own way more, and just say, look, I'm going to avoid being stupid. I'm going to say things as clearly and precisely and simply as I can. And I'm going to have faith that the accumulated experience I've got is going to make something good. And then once it's out there, it's fine. But when you start to overthink it, when you've spent six months planning what it's going to be and you've built it up and it's this big behemoth and then uh, everything's tight and, and awkward and uncomfortable. So anyway, next one, next one. This is a really good one. Uh, Post-journalism, the press lost its monopoly on news when the internet democratized info. To save its business model, it pivoted from journalism into tribalism. The new role of the press is not to inform its readers, but to confirm what they already believe. Post-journalism. Yeah. So <clears throat> there was a study um, published in the Social Science Computer Review. Um, and basically what it was, is a team of researchers analyzed 27 million news articles published between 1970 and 2019. And what they found was that use of words like sexist and racist in the New York Times and in the wider liberal media increased over 400 percent since 2012. So obviously, sexism and racism have not actually increased 400 percent since 2012. It's only the media's use of these terms that's increased. And this they, they found this was the case anyway. You know, they, they found that essentially what happened was that there was some event that had occurred that had caused a massive shift in the editorial policy of the New York Times towards sex and race. And I mean, this was actually, uh, I think, uh, who was it? There was a writer who, who dubbed this the Great Awakening. Uh, he, although he didn't, he didn't refer to this specific example, but he referred to a general trend that, that occurred with the rise of social media in the early 2010s, where there was this sudden shift towards uh, issues of sex and race. And this was driven by the media, I think. I think this was driven by the fact that this, the New York Times was no longer the sole author, you know, one of the sole authorities of news anymore um, with the sort of advent of social media and, and all this alternative media that, that sprang up and stuff like the Joe Rogan podcast and all these alternative sources of information. The New York Times had suddenly lost its authority. Um, it was no longer, it no longer had a monopoly on information. And so obviously they had to do something. And I believe, I don't have any hard evidence of it, but I think that this is what led to this surge in usage of um, terms like sexism, racism, and the rise of the sort of you know woke politics in media, because I feel that it it decided that it was going to cater to hipsters, basically, you know, to, to certain. Sort of, I don't want to stereotype them too much, but the kinds of people who hang out in Starbucks and you know like <laughs> um, you know drinks sort of pumpkin spice latte and all that, you know, they wanted to sort of they thought the these guys spice latte money. crowd will be coming for you hard. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've tried it. They're actually quite nice. I've drank drank a few myself. You, you were a hipster. Um, but I yeah. always knew you were. <laughs> yeah. I did it before everybody else. <laughs> That's the most hipster but, thing um, that you could say. That doesn't defend you from being yeah. a hipster. Yeah. Okay. So what you're uh, saying is that yeah. uh, the the New York Times they need to uh, uh, they need to re-engineer news from being something which accurately portrays what's going on to competing for clicks up against people who are significantly better at getting clicks. Um, what it yeah. seems like, if uh, racism and sexism have increased by 400% since 2012 in New York Times and the liberal media, it seems like racism and sexism have been split-tested as the most limbically hijacking, perfectly curated, tempting way to get people to press on a news article. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the interesting thing with these uh, terms is that they don't just get the audience uh, from the new, they don't just get the liberal audience 
engaged. They also get conservative audience engaged because, you know, the, the conservative sort of uh, media ecosystem is largely reactive, which fits in with their reactionary ideology. So they, they, they react to the liberal politics of the day, to the liberal mainstream media. And so when the New York Times um, says that uh, air conditioning is racist or whatever, then Fox News is going to come out, Tucker Carlson is going to go on and he's going to say, you know, look at this madness in the New York Times, you know, the world's going to hell. The New York Times now is claiming that air conditioning is racist. And the New York Times obviously knows that Tucker Carlson is going to do this. And that's why they do it, because they know that they can provoke him. So then Tucker gets his audience of uh, conservatives to essentially just put, take part in this dialogue, to take part in this sort of debate. And that drives more traffic to the New York Times uh, when people share it, like, look at this craziness, you know, on social media, <laughs> what they're doing, they're doing the New York Times' own work for them. You know, they're just sharing it. Even it doesn't matter if uh, people don't like the New York Times' article, it's still getting shared. And that's what matters at the end of the day. People are clicking on it so that they can hate it. And I think, you know, that's really the, the sort of the liberal media's business model and the conservative media's business model. The liberal media will randomly accuse things of being sexist or racist, knowing that it's going to fire a lot of people, uh, then the, the right-wing media, the conservative media will sort of react just as predicted. And it will just create, it, it's like a sort of symbiosis where they sort of fuel each other, you know, they, they fuel each other's traffic. And, uh, you know, I mean, you do see it happening the other way now as well. You see you know, Tucker Carlson or whatever will, will make a claim, which is absolutely crazy, on Fox News. And then the New York Times will write an opinion piece about him and how he's a danger to, you know, everyone. And he's going to, you know, create the Third Reich or whatever, like, um, oh, sorry, the Fourth Reich. But like, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a back and forth between them. They they have this, this sort of tribal warfare thing going on, and they both mon they both monetized it. They both profit from it, uh, and everybody else loses because everybody else becomes more stupid as a result. And and that's basically the media ecosystem now. I think. The there's, a really, there's a really good quote from Dana White, and this is from three years ago now. And he says, the media are not in the news business. They are in the clickbait business. They think negativity sells and gets clicks. So that's what they deliver. Negativity is their product. And what he's touching on there is the fact that people are more likely to click on sensationalist negative stories than they are. I mean, dude, we see this even when it comes to designing thumbnails for the channel if i use a term like war or battle uh go to war with your mind you must battle for self-improvement stuff like that even though they're being used in a positive manner it's still an inflammatory word and it gets more clicks you know people people see that war yeah. <laughs> that words they see the word war and they go oh war are you gonna click on it even if it is a a war for more fucking hypertrophy or Whatever it is. Anyway, next yeah. one. Uh, noble cause corruption. The greatest evils come not from those seeking to do bad, but from those seeking to do good and believing the ends justify the means. Ironically, few things justify the immoral treatment of others more than the belief that you're more moral than them. Yeah, so if you look at sort of people who do evil things in life, very few of them are actually evil in terms of very few of them actually set out to deliberately do evil. Uh, you know, I mean, there are probably a handful of serial killers who would fall under this uh, umbrella. People like Richard Ramirez, uh, you know, the Night Stalker. I would say he was probably closest you could come to somebody who was just doing things purely because they were evil. He, he deliberately went out to do things because he knew that they were evil. But people like that are extremely rare in life. And the vast majority of, of sort of evil acts in life are committed by people who actually think they're doing good. If you look at history, you know, I mean, how many people have created atrocities as a result of them trying to be evil, trying to do the wrong thing? Uh, not, I don't know of any. But then if you ask yourself, how many people have committed atrocities in the name of trying to do good? Well, you could, you can, there's no end of, of them. You know, they're just everywhere. Like, uh, if, you know, if you look at the classic example, I mean, even people like Hitler, I mean, Hitler's regarded as a classic supervillain. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that he wasn't, he wasn't evil in the sense that he didn't deliberately set out to do evil. He actually believed he was doing the right thing. 
you know, and, and Germany believed he was doing the right thing as well. That's why they elected him. Uh, you know, he wasn't, he didn't just take over power and become a tyrant uh, and go against the German people's wishes. The German people elected him into power and they elected him because they believed in his message, because they believed he was correct that Western, that Germanic civilization was collapsing and uh, it was the fault of, of Jews and gypsies and Jehovah's Witnesses uh, because they were apparently uh, stealing the wealth of the country and they were corrupting the minds of the the youth with degenerate art, as they as the Nazis called it. So these ideas were very common. They were not just common in Germany. They were common in the US. They were common in Europe. Um, Anti-Semitism was, was commonplace in the 1920s and 30s. I mean, you know, there was a, in Madison Square Garden, there was a massive meeting of American Nazis. Now, can, can you imagine that today? Imagine today you had like, uh, you know, um, the Aryan Brotherhood. Nazi Fest 2023. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hiring out Madison Square Garden, you know, and actually having a, a, a live show, neo-Nazi show. And that's what it was like in, in 1920. So there was a lot of people who actually believed that it was right to do what they, what Hitler eventually did, um, you know, which is actually terrifying when you think about it. This wasn't, this wasn't just some madman who just took over power and then decided to exterminate an you know, entire race of people. This was something that had support from the bottom, from the grassroots. It and says, so uh, these people were convinced they were doing the right thing. It says here, ironically, few things justify the immoral treatment of others more than the belief that you're more moral than them. What does the more moral than them part have to play here? Yeah. So if you think, so if, if we go back to the uh, example of, of Jews in Germany, uh, Nazi Germany, uh, Hitler and the Nazis believed that they were morally superior to the Jews because they believed that the Jews were corrupting people um, because they believed, well, first they believed that they were greedy and they were stealing the wealth of, of Germany. Secondly, they believed that they were corrupting uh, the minds of, of Germanic youth um, by, with, the, with their so-called degenerate art. Um, they were essentially undermining civilization. They were parasites that were destroying civilization. So they were immoral in that sense. That's, that's what the Nazis believe. And so the Nazis believe that since these people are not moral people, they're not ethical, since the Jews are not ethical people in their view, it's okay to exterminate them. It's okay. They're not human. They're, they're subhumans. You know, they're untermensch. Uh, wiping them out is good for society. And you see this literally in every other example of this kind. So if we go to the polar opposite example of Stalin, um, Stalin believed that the bourgeoisie were morally inferior to the proletarians. Because they were they were being corrupted by their wealth, uh, they were greedy. They were you know capitalists. They they wanted to enslave uh, everybody else, and so he used this idea that that the humble worker was more uh, moral and more ethical than the bourgeoisie to um, to sort of justify the murder of the bourgeoisie, and not just the bourgeoisie, but pretty much anybody who spoke out against him. So these people were by definition immoral if they, if they spoke out against him because they were obstacles to the utopia that he was trying to enact. So the idea is that if you, know, if, if you can present yourself as more moral than your enemies, then you can justify their slaughter because nobody's going to miss um, a person you know, who's, who's immoral. I mean, I'd like to think about a very commonplace example would be um, the, the idea of, of child molesters. Like child molesters are considered probably the most evil uh, and the, the people, the most least worthy of sympathy people on the planet. And I know people who are really, really good hearted people, like really nice, kind, compassionate people. And I hear them sometimes say things like, I mean, there's one person that I know who's really, really kind person, really compassionate person. And they said that what they wanted was um, for child molesters to be locked in a room with a ground with, with, with floor made out of sandpaper that was basically a treadmill that never ended. You know, that's what they wanted. And they said it, they said it without any malice. They just said that that's what they should do to, to, to child molesters. And this is a classic example. Like if somebody is regarded as morally inferior, then they, they lose any right to compassion in, in, a, in an average person's mind. Like you can, you know, you can say, oh, this person's a child molester, so you can do whatever you like to them because they're not human because of what they've done. And so if you can present a person as morally defective, as morally inferior, then you don't feel bad no matter what happens to them. And that's why, you know, people who are so convinced of their own morality, when they see somebody who's less moral than them or who they think is less moral than them, then they can become complete monsters towards that person. 
So that's where I think a lot of the, the world's greatest atrocities occur is due to that, that sort of belief. Fascinating. Okay, next one. Gwinder's third paradox. In order for you to beat someone in a debate, your opponent needs to realize they've lost. Therefore, it's easier to win an argument against a genius than an idiot. This is the reason I stopped debating. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, well, it's one of the reasons anyway. I, I, I used to debate people all the time on social media. You know, I used to, I used to think it was something worth doing. I actually thought, you know, that I could convince people. But I realized um, after a while that really a debate is not, it's not, it's not really a battle of intellect. It's not a match of wits. Uh, it's really just, uh, it's a more of a battle of ego than intellect because people want to win. They don't want to understand. And they approach their, they, they approach debates. Uh, well, basically there's, there's a, a rationalist thinker called Julia Galef who had this great book called um, Scout Mindset. She came on the podcast. And she basically made the, yeah, yeah, great, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I think I saw that one, yeah. And um, right. yeah, she, yeah, she made the case that basically when people, um, when they enter debates, they tend to approach with a soldier mindset which is that they just want to win. They just want to conquer the enemy. They have no real other goal, but they should really approach with a scout mindset, which is to seek as much information as possible, uh, objective information, do what a scout does rather than what a soldier does. Uh, but the problem is, is that most people are soldiers. They approach with a soldier mindset. And when you approach with a soldier mindset uh, and you're not very bright, what will happen is you're often just keep going because your ego is just driving you you know further and further and you you won't see that you're you've actually lost the, the debate because your ego is just there and you just you're trying to do everything you can you're moving the goalposts you know as much as you can to try to win at all costs i think with smart people this is not to say that smart people don't approach with a soldier mindset they also can be extremely um egotistical and they can be arrogant and stuff like that but they often are more likely to realize when they've screwed up when they've contradicted them, themselves or when they've, uh, you know, they said something that's just factually incorrect, and it's harder for them to come back from that because they realise they've screwed up. You know, so they're like, oh, okay, and they can't just pretend. They can't just, you know, yeah, some of them will, so but, but, but they're Harris just talks, talks about this. He says that um, once you've become convinced of something, even if you claim the opposite, you can no longer unconvince yourself of it. If I convince you that two, plus two equals four and you then see it. You can tell me, no, 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 it's three. I know it's three. But on the inside, you, you can't become, un, un, up until a point at which somebody convinces you of something else, you can't be unconvinced of something which you are convinced of. But as you've spoken about in your most recent Substack article that everybody needs to go and read, smart people plus ideology is a terrifying, co a terrifying cocktail because that can use their ingenuity to engineer a more easily a more uh, uh, fortified defense around their irrational beliefs or around just yeah. beliefs that they haven't assessed. So there's a, another thing that relates to this. So Gwinder's third paradox about needing to ensure that your opponent has to work out that they've lost. And this is from Scott Alexander, and it's years ago. This is from his old stuff. If you're interested in being on the right side of disputes, you will refute your opponent's arguments. But if you're interested in producing truth, you will fix your opponent's arguments for them. To win, you must fight not only the creature you encounter, you must fight the most horrible thing that, be can, that can be constructed from its corpse. It's a very good way of putting it, yeah. Um, there's a, a concept called Rogerian rhetoric, which is how I try to approach uh, any kind of discussion, which is instead of trying to convince that person that they're wrong, what I try to do is I try to understand that person's belief system as as well as I can so I don't necessarily uh, deny uh, or defy anything that they say I just listen and then I ask them questions to work out how they came to that conclusion and then I leave the discussion not having convinced them but having a better understanding of why they believe what they believe and I think that's mm. far more important you know because that helps me to better understand positions that I disagree with um, then I will formally, maybe uh, I will attack their beliefs in a piece of writing, you know, where I can really think it through and I don't have somebody, you know, moving the goalposts or anything like that. But I'll do that formally in like an essay. I won't do it in a discussion. I found that trying to change somebody's beliefs in a debate is almost pointless. It's like trying to change their mind through a rap battle, you know. So it's just uh, <laughs> it worked for it worked for Eminem and Eight Mile, but 
Yeah. I I am I'm totally on board with that. And and someone asked in a Q&A a couple of weeks ago about how I remain at least partially impartial uh when it comes to speaking to people. And for me the question asking I I called it the Socratic method, but you've just called it what was that one? Rogerian rhetoric. It's it's different from the Socratic method because the Socratic method is uh, an attempt to win an argument. It's basically okay. an attempt to ask questions until you lead somebody into contradicting themselves or into okay. saying something that's not true. Whereas Rogerian rhetoric dispenses with that completely. Rogerian rhetoric is purely about um, trying to understand the other person's position from a, a neutral, objective point of view. So trying to understand what experiences in their life led them to the beliefs that they have, have, have with them now, no matter how wrong those beliefs are. You know, so if somebody um, believes that the world is flat, instead of trying to refute that, instead of saying, oh, you know, um, if you use your binoculars and you, you you peer out over the horizon, you'll see that the, the sails of ships appear before their prows. You could say something like that to, do, to refute them. Or what you could do is ask them, so how did you come to this belief system? And what is the evidence that convinced you? And then once you've asked these questions, you get a better understanding of why they believed what they believe why they were persuaded by that and that in itself is valuable because now you understand why people believe it which is probably more valuable to you than understand just refuting them and changing their beliefs do you get mm. what i'm saying so yeah, it's dude, a different I, it's a different value system I actually it's basically think, more about understanding i actually think that that is much closer to the position that i take as well because my goal is very rarely to ask people questions that make them look stupid up until the point at which they ref recant all of the opinions that they've got uh it's much closer to that how do you spell that first thing so it's o-r-v-e g e r i a n so it's okay. roger i a n on the end roger i a n Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so this relates to something that I wrote about a couple of weeks ago, which is what I've called the soft signal of effectiveness. Triggering a tribal response is antithetical to having an effective behavior and belief changing message. It's nowhere near as sexy to caveat heavily. But when it comes to important subjects, the most compelling arguments are sometimes the gentler ones. If you care about changing behavior, you'll dial back the aggression of your argument. Yeah. I mean, I think I tweeted something once, which was along the lines of, um, if you want to convince people, show them that you can be convinced. And I think that works very well in, in, in life, because if you, if you show people that you're open to their arguments and that you, you know, you're, you're willing to hear what they have to say, people are far more likely to reciprocate because they see, they see you as more of an open-minded person and they say, okay, this person gave me a chance, so I'll give them a chance. You know, it's, it's like, um, if you if you go into an argument straight away trying to win and you immediately deny what they're saying and you say that this is wrong this is instead of actually listening to your arguments they judge your character they they essentially use Wittgenstein's ruler in a way um, they they basically form a, a personality profile of you and they say this person is very uh, close minded you know he's not even listening to me. he's just refute he's trying to refute what I'm saying he's attacking me and then they they go into war mode you know they start red alert and then they basically want to you know debate you. So you, you, you set yourself up to fail the moment you try to immediately refute what somebody is saying. I think it's much better just to sort of um, just to listen to them. And again, you know, use this Rogerian rhetoric, understand why they believe what they believe. And I mean, this shouldn't, you know, this shouldn't be um, something that you do just so that you can win an argument. You shouldn't just listen to them so that you can understand their argument so that you can beat their argument. But it should really be a goal in itself just to understand, you know, that you you have a better understanding of other people because it's it's important to understand why people believe what they believe just as much as it's important to believe the right thing you know so um it 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 helps for particularly for people like you and me who are seeking to understand human behavior we need to understand why people adopt false beliefs and that is much better achieved by just having a good conversation with them not disagreeing with them just asking them questions about their belief, about their life, about why, you know, what kind of evidence convinced them, what kind of evidence might convince them that they're wrong, you know, and and these kinds of things. And then it makes you more well-equipped to deal with these beliefs in future as well. That's an added bonus. I love that. Tilting at windmills. An online stranger doesn't know you. All they have are a few vague impressions of you, too meager to form anything but a phantasm. So 
when they attack you, they're really just attacking their own imagination and there is no need to take it personally. Yeah. I mean, when I first joined social media, uh, started tweeting in 2016, I used to get quite upset when I used to get like nasty comments and stuff, you know, <laughs> like people would say stuff and, you know, it would get, I would, I would believe it in a way. I'd be like, you know, like they'd, they'd say stuff about me and I'd, you know, they'd call me like, um, well, I'd, I'd, sometimes I'd just be called a dumb shit or whatever. You know, sometimes people would say that uh, I was a pseudo intellectual or whatever. And, and I, I, back then, you know, I, I used to sort of think, oh, okay, I must have said something that was wrong, you know, for them to, to think that. And then I realized after a while, hang on a second, I don't know anybody who I um, engage with online. I don't actually know any of them. I don't have, even have an idea of who they are, really. But I've convinced myself that I know who they are. So therefore, I mean, the same must be happening to other people doing that to me. They, they couldn't possibly know who I really am. You know, they've only seen one or two of my posts and then they've built up a personality profile of me based on those two posts, you know. And... I mean, we barely know people that we know in real life. You can live with someone for five years and still not really understand who they are. And yet we seem to think that, you know, we can read one post by someone or, you know, watch one video by that person. And immediately we think that we know that person. And this is a very powerful illusion that influences, I think, almost every... In fact, I would say that everybody is afflicted by this delusion um, where we, we just get a tiny snippet of a person's words or their actions, just a tiny snippet. And from that, we just build this massive fictional character in our heads, you know, from that skeleton, you know, I mean, I actually, I think I did tweet something along the lines of that. I'll read it out to you. Um, yeah, this was a tweet I recently sent actually. So I'll read it. So it says, uh, you are a different character in the mind of each person who knows you because their impression of you is made of the bones of what they've seen fleshed out by a musculature of pure imagination. And I think that really sums up what we do when we see people online where, you know, we just have this bare bones, just the bare bones based on a very brief interaction with someone. And then from that, we, we create this whole fictional character who is very real in our minds, but doesn't actually exist outside of our own heads. And that is the person that we level our criticism at. That is a person that we level our praise at. And that is a person that will defend or attack in arguments. And, you know, we'll develop all these theories about this person who doesn't actually exist. And that happens all of the time. And it happens... I realized it was happening to me. You know, people were doing that to me. They would say things about me that just wasn't true. Like, for instance, if I wrote a tweet that criticized the left, people would say that I was right wing, but I'm not right wing at all. You know, <laughs> in fact, I'd say that, you know, I, I, I don't really have strong political opinions, but I'm probably a centrist overall, generally. I find that, you know, I agree with some of the left, I agree with some of the right things and just merge them together. But left wingers, when I, when I criticize the left, People assume that I'm like some far right guy and they'll be like, you know, they'll, they'll write, oh, you're a, you're a crypto fascist. And then if I criticize the right, you know, um, then uh, so, yeah, if I criticize the right, then people say I'm a globalist, libtard, you know, uh, you know, all this stuff, like, you know, I'm a WEF shill or whatever. Like, you know, so good. Then, there's never been a better yeah. time to insult someone than right now. Exactly. And, I, and I'm just there, like, you know, before this would have really upset me, you know, I would have been like, just, just from the fact that it was just because I wasn't used to it. I wasn't used to receiving all this hate. But now when I read it, I actually read it with a smile on my face. You know, I'm just like, because I know that this person is not actually attacking me. They're attacking their own imagination. Yes. Well, you know, here's one, uh, here's maybe a couple of, of interesting considerations to add in there. This is one of the reasons why audience capture is so dangerous because the only way that someone can genuinely tilt at windmills is if they have an erroneous view of who you are really compared with what they've seen of you online. But if your entire persona has subsumed the person and you are playing a role on the internet, quite rightly, they're pointing at the person that you are on the internet. And what you've done is you've basically become cooked by your own audience. You're now this marionette that's being played by the algorithm to the point where you do whatever it asks of you, you feed red meat to the, to the mob. So when someone does point the finger and say, you're a globalist shill, or you're a, a, a woke libtard, or you're a right-wing racist or whatever, when someone does say that, where is the firm place for you to stand? Where, where have you got that you can actually stand if you have sold your soul 
in order to gain notoriety online uh, and your integrity is something that you can't buy back no matter how much you try and pay for it. If you've done that, where is the, you can't grin when people criticize you because they're criticizing the contrived uh, monster that you made, that you created yourself into. Absolutely. And it's a self-reinforcing feedback loop as well. Because like, if you're, if you're someone like, say, um, let's use an example. Let's use someone like Tim Pool, for instance. Tim Pool was originally sort of like a kind of uh, anti, uh, he, was a, he was an Occupy Wall, uh, Wall Street guy. And he was sort of, I'd say he was quite progressive, he was quite left. And he began to sort of flirt with some right-leaning ideas. And he developed a right-wing audience. And over time, it, the people on the left who were formerly followers of his, they began to attack him, you know, saying, oh, you're a right wing shill now, you know, you know you're a racist, uh, sexist, transphobe, blah, blah, blah. And so they were attacking this. And what happened was that Tim began to take this time. At least this is what it appears like to me. I don't know him personally, but this is what it seems like to me. Um, he seems to have taken that to heart and he became gradually more and more right wing. Uh, so, I mean, I would say he's probably on the right now. I don't know if he would agree with that, but based on what I know of his his content, he seems to be pretty firmly conservative. Although he calls himself a liberal, his his opinions don't gel with his self perception. So I think he's a, he's a pretty good idea of somebody who's succumbed to audience capture. Um, he he might still think he's a liberal, but all of his guests pretty much are people on the right or at best at the centre. Um, he doesn't really have he doesn't engage with left people very often. Um, you know, the only time that I really remember him doing that in recent history was. Uh, with Vijay Agadi uh, on the Joe Rogan podcast. Uh, but generally, he seems to be pretty firmly on the right. He's got his, you know, his, his friends are people like the Quartering, who are also sort of somewhat, they call themselves liberal, but they're really more slightly to the right. Um, and I think what's happened is when left people call people like Tim Pool out, what happens is this makes him even more audience captured because he then says, you know, I'm a centrist. How can you call me right wing? How can you call me a, a racist? I'm a centrist. And then he'll say, oh, no, no, no. It's not me who's moved. It's you who've moved. You, you have gone crazy and not me. And so he'll go even further to the right and say, these people are absolutely crazy. They're accusing me of being racist. And, you know, so it, it's like a self-perpetuating cycle. And then he becomes a bit more right wing. So then the left attack him even more saying, oh, you know, you, you, you're a racist. You, so it just keeps going on and on and on. And, you know, it happens, I think, across the spectrum. That's just one example. I mean, there are probably people who have done this, who've moved leftwards and, um, you know, they've been attacked by people on the right uh, due to that. And then they've gone even more to the to the left as a result of that. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a mutual sort of cycle, uh, symbiosis. There's another one that I think relates to what we've just spoken about, which is the principle of humanity. Every single person is exactly what you would be if you were them. This includes your political opponents. So instead of dismissing them as evil or stupid, maybe seek to understand the circumstances that led them to their conclusions. Yeah, so, I mean, this is, again, this is part of why Rogerian rhetoric is so valuable uh, because we don't really have a good idea of anybody that we meet only online, you know. Uh, there are people that I've got relationships with online who I feel like I know well, but I don't. I just don't because all I've seen is what they've chosen to show me. And when you, when all you've seen is what people have show, chosen to show you, uh, it, you, there are selection effects to that and you develop a very distorted idea of, of who they are. And this causes you to have assumptions about people and it can, you know, just cause you to have completely skewed reality. Um, and the thing, so if you really want to understand who somebody really is, a much better strategy is to try to look at who, how they became who they were, put yourself in their shoes and to reflect on their own internal logic, the, the internal logic of their own actions to try to understand, because you've got to bear in mind that everybody does things that they think are right for them. You know, everybody, like every action that somebody takes, they take because they think it's the right thing to do. Even if it's the wrong thing to do, they think it's the right thing to do, which is why they do it. So if you can use that assumption to try to reverse engineer a person's life experience and find out why they did the things that they did, then you can develop a much more deeper understanding than if you simply look at what they've said online and what they've done online 
and you know what's been said about them or written about them these are all going to be things that are sort of subject to selection effects you know um people are always going to comment on the most extraordinary most wildest wildest things that people have done they're not going to comment on the the more mundane things that people do in their lives you know for every crazy uh cancelable thought that a person has they have thousand opinions that are just run of the mill and mundane yeah you know? but what happens is that if somebody says one thing that you don't like you know you're you're basically just regard that one thought in that entire galaxy of thoughts that is their mind and you're just you know you use that one little thought to just sort of judge them and to dismiss them or to fall in love with them or whatever you know yeah and so it's it's much more important to have a, a a full holistic understanding of a person's life because what they show on online is just nothing it's it's just it's the tip of the iceberg you can't see that massive iceberg that is all of the things that are motivating them behind the scenes off offline you know in their life that's why uh the rogan n-word cancellation video didn't hold water because the way that mainstream media and cancellation attempts usually work is this is the smoking gun of his racist transphobic bigoted views that we always knew were there and we always told you were there and every, I had I had the inclination do you remember I said I thought Joe Rogan was a racist and this is the tip of the iceberg the issue that you had with Rogan his protective mechanism was that even a casual fan of his may have listened to 200 or 500 hours and you know there's some people out there that have listened to thousands and thousands of hours of him they say you're telling me this is the tip of the iceberg i've seen the whole iceberg i know that there's nothing lurking down there and i have reliable difficult to falsify evidence that suggests that joe is a reliable good non-bigoted guy and that asymmetry it's the vacuum and the holes with in somebody's uh, personality persona um that gets filled by speculation and accusation from the press and if you have a sufficiently large body of work and a sufficiently big audience that's been exposed to enough of it that's actually protective in that regard yeah this is why cancel culture is fundamentally elitist and fundamentally anti left and i tried to use this argument before i wrote an essay about why cancel culture is not actually left wing um because the only thing that cancel culture can cancel is people who don't really have much social media presence people do, who don't have much clout people who are largely powerless there are occasional exceptions but you know in order in order for this to be an exception you have to do something that's extremely um beyond the pale like you know sexual assault or something like that um if you just make a comment about something um then you you're going to get cancelled if you don't have much clout but you won't be cancelled if you have a lot of clout and a lot of people know you well online you know famous people very very rarely get cancelled for just one thing that they say whereas poor people or people who are just ordinary people you know like that 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 lady i always think of that lady who um, i don't even remember her name which is telling i suppose but uh you know she said that she was going to go to um she was on going to hop on a flight to africa and she was she wanted people to pray for her that she didn't get aids or something like that and she said joke. only joking I'm, I'm white. I'm white. Yeah, yeah yeah that was like a decade what, just a ago, thoughtless yeah. Yeah, it was a stupid tweet. It was just a thoughtless tweet that uh, how many thoughtless tweets do people send or you know thoughtless posts that people don't even think about. They just post it just thinking that it's being funny. I've done that plenty of times. I've I've not said anything probably that stupid, but I've said stuff that's almost as stupid as that. Um and you know, it it could have been any one of us who who said something like that really. And it was just off the cuff. She did it before she got on to the plane. When she got off the plane, she realized that life was it over. blown up and pretty much everybody knew who she was life and now was she was delicious. yeah. <laughs> her life was over, you know, which is it was really it's actually quite sad, but it was I mean it was weirdly amusing, but it was also really sad like because she did lose um her her livelihood as a result of that. And if she was more famous, she wouldn't have lost that livelihood. because not only because of the things that you just mentioned about people would know from her past experience she probably wasn't a racist person you know she there are plenty of people that i know personally who are not racist who occasionally make jokes about race you know uh, who, you know they, it just happens it's just it's just a commonplace thing but people online act as though if you make one joke that's mildly racist that means that you literally want to start a holocaust and you know you want to wipe out non-white people or whatever like you know there's a massive difference between those two things you know there's there's people who joke about racism but they wouldn't judge somebody by their race in the real world they wouldn't you know uh, 
they wouldn't do that. But then there's people out there who, who would, who would do that. And then the two groups often get confused and this happens a lot. But if you actually know somebody like Joe Rogan in your example, if you have a long history of, of listening to that person, then you get, you realize that they're one of the, the group that might occasionally say something that's offensive, but isn't one of those people, isn't like a racist, isn't yes. sexist. You, you know, so I wonder if, uh, I wonder if this relates to, is it Brandolini's law and concept creep? So as a particular social uh, problem becomes uh, more rare, the definition of that needs to be expanded. And with Brandolini's law, as the living standards in a society rise, people's expectations rise along with it. Yeah, so that's so the first one you got correct there. That's, uh, yeah, uh, the the second one is not Brandolini's law. That's Tocqueville Paradox. I knew it. I bloody bloody knew it. (laughs) But yeah, (laughs) You got all the other ones correct, though, so that's fair Thank enough. You. I knew that uh, there would be a fucking quiz at some point. Right, next one. <laughs> next one. Um, overblown implications effect. We think people judge us by a single success or failure, but they don't. If you mess up one meal, no one thinks you're a bad chef. And if you have one great idea, no one thinks you're a genius. People just aren't thinking about you that much. Yeah, I mean, I've when I was young, when I was a teenager, I used to suffer from anxiety. Um you know, I used to, when I would enter a room, I would immediately feel like everybody was looking at me and I would feel like my every micro movement of my body was being sort of analysed, you know, like as, a, as if it was like literally like I was on a reality TV show or something. And um, it really was like almost paralysing experience. And it took me a long time to really realise that, hang on a second, I'm just not that important. Like most people just do not give a fuck about me, you know. And it was such a liberating feeling. Because it's it's true for a start, but also, you know, it, it just helps you to realize, um, to, to basically take away, you know, if, you, if, if you're focusing on what other people think about you, you won't really live your life how you want to live it. You won't have that sense of independence. You'll be completely dependent on what other people think or what you think other people think about you. But in reality, people just don't care. People are more worried about how they appear to you than about how you appear to them. Um, you know, like 10 years ago, if I was to go on this show, like you've got 750,000 subscribers, right? If I was here thinking about what 750,000 people are thinking about me, you know, while I'm saying these, this stuff right now, I would, I'd be paralyzed. I wouldn't be able to do anything. I'd be here like stuttering and I'd just be like, oh, you know, I wouldn't be able to say anything because I just, my mind would be completely filled with the thoughts of 750,000 people thinking of me. The way I look at it is, People are going to watch this episode. They'll probably take some good things from it, hopefully, if, if all goes to plan. Uh, but they won't really remember me much. They won't remember my uh, mistakes that I said, you know, whatever. If I said something wrong, they won't really remember it. Um, they won't focus on it. They're not going to stalk me. I'm not attractive enough to be stalked. So I don't really need to worry about all of these things, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just soon. basically... Don't speak too soon, mate. <laughs> yeah well i think it, it takes something quite drastic for that to happen but like um yeah i mean generally speaking i'm you know i find that it, you just end up another thing is that you actually end up looking a lot better to other people if you don't care too much what they think of you and this is not to say that you shouldn't I, i'm not you know into that whole you know you shouldn't give a fuck and all that shit i don't think that's that's really good i think you should care what people think but you shouldn't um you, you shouldn't be constantly focusing on what they think of you. You know, you should, you should just make an effort just to be relaxed and just to be yourself. Um, not, not because of, you know, like you, you want people to, um, I mean, really, I mean, the main reason I want, pe- I think that you should try to be yourself is because if you try to be someone who's fake, then you have to essentially create uh, that character and you have to become that character so it essentially is a prelude to audience capture um you know if you try to be someone you're not if you're constantly focusing on how you appear to others you'll stop being who you really are and you'll begin to play to that audience and you'll essentially be acting in the limelight of their gaze and you will cease to be who you actually are which is i I think dangerous i spoke about this in a tedx talk a couple of years ago and i said that the persona is incapable of receiving love it can only receive praise and mm. it was something I learned from Aubrey Marcus that if you're only playing a role, then any compliments that you receive won't existentially connect with you inside because it doesn't feel like someone's complimenting you. They're just complimenting this projection 
of what you thought they wanted, which is, yeah. I don't know. I mean, sure, if you do a shadow puppet that's really good, fantastic, well done, look at what you created. But it's not the same as someone saying you as an individual, this very natural, unencumbered projection of your very essence that you've brought forward into the world, combining all of your predispositions and genetics with life experiences and traumas, that is worthy of love and acceptance and praise and all the rest of it. Like that's so fulfilling. And it was one of the things that I really noticed transitioning from an industry where I, I did have to be more performative. Oddly had to be more performative uh, as a guy stood on the front door of a nightclub than a guy that talks on a podcast. Um, I found that I would do and say things that, were incongruous with who I really was, even though I wasn't necessarily doing the self-assessment to realize it. It's only in retrospect that I got to to work out that I was playing this role. But someone would ask me my opinion and, and I would think, okay, what does Gwinda want to hear from me at this moment? What what should I say in order to engender the most positive response that I can get from him? And it was fucking crippling. Like it was it was absolutely crippling because I'm permanently playing this meta me game. I'm always having mm. to be one degree of separation removed. I don't actually have an opinion. I don't actually hold any truths myself. What I hold are various avatars that I all need to exist in my mind at one time because the the you that I am, to, the me that I am for you and the me that I am for my housemate and the me that I am for my mom and the me that I am for all of the other people in my life all need to be very carefully held and 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 remembered and what did I say to him last time? What was my opinion about that? Did I think it was going to be Tommy Fury or Jake Paul that was going to win? And da 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 da, like all of that, all of that. It's incredible computationally. It's it's basically yeah. impossible. It is. Yeah. I mean, there's a quote that's been attributed to uh, Mark Twain. I don't know if he actually said it, but it's attri attributed to him. And it's um, something like, uh, "If you tell the truth, then you don't need to remember anything." Yep. And I think that that really saves you a lot of energy. You know, if you are just who you really are and you just are relaxed and just say what you really think and you don't try to put on a front, it just saves so much energy in, in interactions. You know, I used to be exhausted in interactions, social interactions, because I was constantly acting. I was constantly trying to impress or I was constantly trying to be the person that I thought people expected me to be. And it, like you said, you know, it's just this constant sort of computational sort of power, like just to be, you know, your brain is being fried by all this you know, circuitry firing off. And um, it, it's just not good because you end up not being who you really are and you end up taxing yourself. You end up sort of exhausting yourself uh, to be someone who, you, who, who you're not. And at the end of it all, people probably don't even fucking remember. So <laughs> yes, you know, after all of that, I didn't even yeah. fucking care. Yes. It's something okay. that exists only in your head. Yeah. Let's get, let's try and get one or two more in because some of these are so good. And I've got, enough to do another episode that we haven't got through. So meme theory, an ideology parasitizes the mind, changing the host's behavior so they spread it to other people. Therefore, a successful ideology, the only kind we hear about, is not configured to be true. It is configured only to be easily transmitted and easily believed. Yeah, I think this idea is one of my favorite ideas uh, because I think it explains so much of the information landscape uh, if you if you look at the sort of the dominant ideologies on the on the internet right now you'll see that they're all adapted evolutionarily adapted for nothing else than their own propagation um and so i mean we like to use the, the sort of woke ideology as an example because it's one of the most prominent ideologies right now um and wokeism is very powerful idea in terms of it, it's a very fertile idea it spreads very quickly because it allows people to signal uh, compassion open-mindedness cosmopolitanism and all of these very highly prized social uh, forms forms of social capital basically uh, so that if you know if something is good at making people look good then it's obviously going to be adopted like a fashion. That's that's the very definition of a fashion. A fashion is something that emerges that in the current age makes people look like they're sophisticated, clued up, cosmopolitan, you know, all of these things. And that's exactly what wokeism does. The claims of wokeism are false. Um, you know, if you look on Wikipedia, that they're, they're presented as fact. So, for instance, um, implicit association tests—they're pure pseudoscience. And yet, if you go on Wikipedia, you'll see that. 
you know, Wikipedia will claim that implicit association tests can te can determine whether someone is a racist or not. The fact of the matter is, is that in experiments, implicit association tests um, are as about as reliable as lie, lie detectors. You could give somebody the same implicit association test twice and have radically different results each time. In fact, that's what often happens. Um, so they don't really measure anything apart from what you're thinking at a specific moment in time. But because if you believe in implicit association tests and you believe in implicit bias and all this other stuff and white fragility and everything else that comes from that, then suddenly you're clued up, especially if you're a white person. If you're a white person who believes in white fragility, then this signals, oh, look, look I'm a white person, but I hold white people to uh, account for you know, their crimes against black people. So therefore I'm a very selfless person. You know, I'm doing things that are not in my own interests. So therefore I'm a very compassionate person. I'm very altruistic and all this. It signals very, very powerful things to other people online. And that's one of the reasons why wokeism has become such a powerful force in the world. Um, and it, you know, it, it's, it's not just wokeism. I mean, we can use other examples. We can use the, the posing ideology. We can use basedism, you know, being based, being red pilled. Um, this idea that, you know, uh, you should just not care what anybody else thinks. You should be who you want to be and all sorts of stuff. This ideology is very powerful because it signals to others that you are strong, that you um, you don't fold uh, by, you know, uh, when you're met with the uh, sort of the, the, the mob, the, the woke mob. You don't, you know, you're basically, you're independent minded and all this other stuff. So a lot of these, in fact, all of the dominant ideologies now, they all offer things uh, besides anything epistemic so they don't have epistemic value they're not they don't have value in being true they have value in what they allow you to signal to others and so this is really why these ideologies are so powerful it's why they have taken over that's why meme theory and cultural parasitism parasit by, by the way this is an idea that was originally formulated by richard dawkins um i adapted it a little bit in my in my tweet uh, to sort of uh, you know, just to sort of sum, sum it up in one tweet. But yeah, the, the original credit for this idea uh, comes from Richard Dawkins. Uh, he was the first to realise, I mean, he applied this idea to religion because he saw that, you know, religion is not configured to be true. It's configured to be easily disseminated and easily believed. And, you know, in his view, what gave religion value was not its epistemic claims, but the idea that it gives people comfort from death it allows them to, it gives them meaning to their lives. It gives them purpose. It gives them something to uh, as, aspire to. Um, and then people like Nassim, uh, Nicholas Taleb and Jordan Peterson added new uh, benefits to it, saying that it was also an ancestral memory, which helped to codify uh, culture and people's uh, you know, ideas that work sort of thing. So, um, you know, it was basically like a kind of, uh, it was a, a repository of knowledge. Religion was a repo repository of knowledge through which, people would um, encode ideas that worked in, in everyday life. Tell you what's interesting is something that I've noticed a lot of people who 10, 20, 40 years ago would have been very anti-religion, you know, uh, forthcoming atheists, now are lamenting the loss of something that looks an awful lot like religion. Douglas Murray is a great friend. Mm. But, you know, he wrote The Strange Death of Europe. He talked quite heavily about the the, the problems that occurred there. Uh, and he wasn't exactly one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but he wasn't like, a, he was tangential to, to that group. And obviously, uh, Sam Harris as well. But Douglas's second last book, The Madness of Crowds, was all about the collapse of grand narratives. The whole purpose was that we have lost ourselves in the world and that people are now praying at the altar of pretty shitty gods. Sam Harris as well, talking about, similar lines i haven't spoken to either of them about you know what are your views on religion but i think that both of them would say bloody hell it would be nice if we had a grand narrative that held the entire nation together and, and gave people a shared sense of of belonging what, what do you think's going on there is that has the vacuum that's been uh, left by the exit of religion allowed even worse things to be sucked in and uh, are people now wondering how much baby was thrown out with the bathwater this is a question that has occupied me for a very long time, and I'm going to be I'm going to write a long essay about this at some point uh, because I've been entertaining this idea for for years, and I do I do accept that. I think I'm one of those people. I was one of the new atheist sort of crowd kind of people. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't one of like uh, you know I wasn't sort of uh, a famous person or anything, but I was somebody who grew up um, 
listening to Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and people like that. And, you know, I, um, I did think that religion was pretty much an unmitigated disaster for a long time. And then with the rise of wokeness and, uh, and these alternative ideologies, well, you thought that was bad. Religions. Let, let us, let us yeah. give you this. <laughs> and then, um, I realized that, hang on a second. I mean, I, I was also influenced. I was somewhat influenced by the ideas of people like, uh, there's a great, evolutionary psychologist called Steve Stewart Williams. He's a professor Phenomenal. at the University of Nottingham. Amazing, the Echo yeah. Understood. The Echo uh, Understood the Universe is the best evolutionary psychology book of all time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would I would definitely recommend that. As anybody who, who wants like a, a good grounding in, in evolutionary theory should read that because it's easy to understand and it's very colourfully written and it's just beautifully explained. Um yeah, I mean it, f- from his work and also uh from the work of a few other uh thinkers, I, I sort of realised that, hang on a second, religion actually did have some kind of a function. I mean, I don't think Steve actually made this um, claim himself, but he, he had his, he had an adjacent claim, which was that culture is the means by which we um, codify uh, sort of heuristics, essentially. So, you know, we, we justify heuristics by um, sort of uh, giving them this kind of divine authority. And that, that's how they survive through the generations. They're passed from one generation to the next useful heuristics for living life um for instance you know like avoiding um uncooked pork or whatever like you know because of the trichinosis and other parasites uh, yeah, it's the uh, um, what is it the uh literally uh uh what is it figuratively true but literally false yeah absolutely yeah and uh, he uh, steve stewart williams has this idea called cumulative culture which is the idea that individually you and i are not very smart. We don't really, we, if we were left alone in this world, we would not survive for very long. The only reason we have um, the value, the, the, the sort of information that we have and the knowledge that we have is because of all the information that was transmitted to our generation by past generations through culture. So it's because we're part of this culture that, that we have learned all of the things that our previous generations learned and survived to tell the tale, you know? So, you know, if we were just an isolated individual with no past, we, we would, we would not have like we would we would be born in this world. We would probably gain a rudimentary understanding of things like gravity because things would fall when we you know if we dropped an apple it would fall. So we would realize okay gravity is a thing. We wouldn't call it gravity, but we would just know it as a force that causes things to fall to the earth. And then from there we would gradually and very slowly, just very slowly accumulate information. But the fact of the matter is is that there are people who have been there before us who have learned all of these things before. And they supercharge our knowledge when we're born, because when we go to school, we learn about gravity. We learn about all of these other things that have happened, all of the things that passed. So we are the sort of cumulative experience of all past generations. And religion is the means by which this information is transmitted from generation to generation. That's why I call it an ancestral memory, because it's like a memory for our, our species as a whole. And so there is value. I think there is value in religion. That's one thing. Another aspect of religion is that it it does preserve a sense of order which we've seen collapse now with you know the sort of rise of crazy gender ideology and all sort of stuff um you know religion did have a certain purpose in that it it kept people in this sort of system where things were structured and there was you know order essentially there was it, we impose order on a chaotic world by inventing myths and by following these myths as if they are the law. And so there is that kind of value. I, w- I didn't appreciate that until relatively recently. And I think I, I actually did a lot of research into this. And I found that, yes, wokeness, I think, has definitely, at least in part, been caused by the abandonment of religion. And I, I say this as an atheist. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a staunch atheist. I'm convinced um, that there is no God. But at least not in this universe. There might be in other universes. But at the same time, I also... I accept that the, lo- the loss of religion uh, did play a part in the rise of wokeness. And this this can actually be traced because um, there, if you look at one of the ways that um, wokeness became such a big issue, uh, became such a big ideology, it was through something called Atheism Plus, which was um, a movement that sort of arose at the tail end of new atheism um, when a, a group of people... On the left, uh, like P.Z. Myers, who's a biologist, um, he, he was one of the leaders of the movement. They basically um, 
came to the conclusion that if we if if new atheism is going to kill religion we're going to need something to replace it we're going to need a, a new system of values and it's kickstarted this movement of new atheists basically that decided that the best way to the best thing to replace uh, religion with is social justice so they came out with this thing called atheism plus and this was a massive thing i mean this you know people a lot of people who were part of this ended up becoming involved in things like gamergate and a lot of the early woke combat with the the sort of right um, began out of this uh, there was a a lady called uh, I've forgotten her name Rachel uh, do you remember the, the the lift incident where there was a there was a atheist i think her name was Rachel Rachel something i've forgotten her name but she was quite prominent around 2012 20, 2011 2012 basically she was a new a new atheist who became like one of the the main sort of people in, in atheism plus and she had this um, sort of uh, incident in a lift where a guy uh, joked about going to the lingerie section or something and she said it was like misogynistic and it kicked up a massive fuss and even Richard Dawkins got involved what was her name Rachel Rachel Watson I think her name was let me just quickly check it online just to check I don't want to incriminate the wrong person Inc um, accuse the wrong Rachel Watson yeah <laughs> yeah Rachel Watson um, I think her name was Rachel Watson something like that lingerie but it's not important like I mean sorry Rebecca Watson it was Rebecca Watson yeah, Rebecca Watson. But yeah, she was one of them. And then Matt Dillahunty was another guy. Uh, he was another one who who was part of this movement. And then the aforementioned PZ Mize. And what they did is basically they, these people went extremely hard into the whole social justice stuff. But they went so hard. They were they basically led to the rise of this uh, website called Rational Wiki. Have you heard of that? R I have Rational heard Wiki of that. is a, it, And that's now like it's probably uh, just a, a, a laundry list of all of the unspeakable people from the right. Yeah. And Rational Wiki emerged out of Atheism Plus. It's basically Rational Wiki is is the worst. OK, it's not the worst website on the, on the Internet, but it's it's the worst website that appears on the first page of Google search results <laughs> uh, for most searches. It's, it's quite a popular website, but it's um, because a lot of people see the term Rational Wiki and they assume that it's rational. They assume that it's a rational name. wiki, well but branded. it's anything but. Yeah, exactly. It, it basically exists just, just to um, shame people for having views that are not woke basically. And uh, this was a major, this was a major facilitator of wokeness in the first half of the 2010s. Uh, and even in the sort of like the first half of the 2000s, I think it's sort of the latter half of the 2000s. Um, because this was really like a, a massive push by new atheists who wanted something to replace the loss of religion with, and they found it in social justice. And then that movement gradually it, it dovetailed with uh, critical race theory and with critical theory. Critical theory and critical race theory are two different things. Um, and, um, you know, gender ideology and, and all sorts of stuff, they all dovetailed together and they sort of formed wokeness, the Great Awakening, which was in the sort of, you know, 2012, 2013. But Atheism Plus was a major um, a sort of facilitator of wokeness. Um, nobody has written about this so far. Uh, but I've done a lot of research into it, and I'm going to write an essay on this at some point. Get um, the article written, mate. Look, dude, let's yeah. let's bring this one home. Everybody needs to subscribe to your Substack. Everyone that is listening, where should they go for that, and yeah. what else should they follow? So, uh, yeah, Substack is is g u r w i n d e r uh, dot substack dot com. Uh, it's much better if I just spell out the name because people never know how to spell my name, and uh, my Twitter is G underscore S underscore B-H-O-G-A-L at, uh, basically, that, that's Twitter. Yeah, at Twitter. It's not at what Twitter. Are you gonna just, write, what are you going to write next? So the next thing I'm working on is about uh, the AI misinformation explosion and how it is actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. Uh, it's gonna, yeah, that's it's one gonna hell of a people... fucking open loop. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Did you see <laughs> yeah. you see that uh Eliezer Yukowski is believes that uh, language learning models are causing so much of a problem that he's uh removed his sabbatical from doing podcasts. That's the... I watched his pod I actually watched it. I watched his podcast recently. There's a, a podcast entitled something like We're All Gonna Die or something like that. And I thought, okay, I've got to watch this because you know I respect Eliza. I think he's a very smart guy, yeah. um, and I I agree with a lot of what he says. I don't agree with everything he says. I think he does slightly oversell the threat of AI, but not by much. Not by yeah. much. I think a lot of his points are very important. He's a. And I think. 
a much needed counterweight to the oh, it's just they're just the techno utopianists. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I will I will be covering his theories at some point as well. I'm going to be writing a lot more often now um, because I'm going to be uh, just doing this full-time. I've been meaning to do this full-time, Substack full-time. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but I'm going to be doing this thing full-time very soon, and I'm going to be churning out articles a lot more often. And, good. Uh, That's good for me. That cover. gives me more stuff to talk about. That gives me more excuses yeah. to bring you back on. I, I absolutely adore every time that you Thanks, come on. Yeah. Everyone needs to go subscribe to your Substack and it's follow you on pleasure. Twitter. Dude, until next time, I appreciate you. Thanks, Chris. Always a pleasure. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.